da da. I have no way to send out emojis. <laughs> I know that is the like little hand part. thing. There is a raise hand, though we don't use it for any reason. Wow. Although I see people pouring in. Hello, everybody. All these people. <laughs> Welcome, welcome. Oh, Trong, it's not going to be a small oh. crowd. Hey, what are you here? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah. Hello, guys. Welcome. I'm just going to give it a few more seconds while the hordes pour in. Um, you know, go get cozy. Grab mm -hmm. your blankets and a cup of tea. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, welcome to our little virtual event space. Uh, I'm Allie. I will be hosting for the evening. I'm the person to shout out if something is going horribly wrong. Um, and, you know, if I can't hear you, shouting is perfectly legitimate in the chat box as well. I'll still, uh, you know, see it. <laughs> um, I am so, so excited to be introducing Tilly Walden and Chung Lee Wynn here to discuss his new graphic novel, The Magic Fish. Uh, so before we get into the fun stuff, I just want to really quickly thank you guys so, so much for tuning in and, of course, for buying books. Your guys' support really is what keeps this place going, and we really love what we do. So if you also love what we do, we would so appreciate it if you come on in. Um, come check out the bookstore. We are open. Um, we have some limited capacity, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, come in, come check it out, come browse books. It's really fun and nice in there, and we miss you guys. So, you know, come join us. But if you're not in the area, that is totally valid and okay because we do ship. Um, Shipping is just $350 and you get to support USPS as well, which is like a little added bonus. Um, I will be linking books in the chat, so they will be very easy to find. Um, and you know, while you're over on the website, I definitely recommend checking out some of our other upcoming events. We've got some really exciting people coming through in the next few weeks. Um, and definitely sign up for our newsletter. It's just a once a week um email with exciting events and releases, books that are signs that we have on hand, cool blog posts that we've written, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. All of the good community stuff you could hope for in a bookstore uh, newsletter. Uh, we're not going to spam you, it's just once a week, so go ahead and sign up for that. Or if that is not for you, of course, come and join us on social media. We are at Third Place Books on all of the major social media sites. We even have a uh, TikTok, which is so much fun. We have a good time over there. So go and check it out and see if that's for you. Um, so we are going to be here for about an hour. And towards the end, we will definitely be taking questions. Uh, I see that everyone is already found the chat box, which I love to see. Um, just go ahead and keep shouting at each other and at us. That is the best part. <laughs> um, and but when it does come to the time for Q&A, go ahead and make sure you, that you throw those into the Q&A box because that will make it so, so much easier for us to find your questions. So uh, keep chatting. Tell us where you're from. Um, oh my gosh, I'm loving these emojis. Good stuff, good stuff. We were just sad because we didn't have emojis. So yeah, fill them up. <laughs> um, but when it comes time for questions, definitely in the Q&A box so that we can find them. So I believe that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I have been keeping my cool all night, but I'm a huge fan of both of these creators and I'm so excited to introduce Tilly Walden, uh, the cartoonist and illustrator currently is uh, currently teaching in Vermont at the Center for Cartoon Studies. She is the creator of six graphic novels, including On a Sunbeam, Spinning, and her latest, the Eisner Award winning, Are You Listening? And of course, Trung Lee Wynn, also known as Trungles, <laughs> uh, the <laughs> comic book artist and storyteller. He has contributed work for Oni Press, Boom Studios, the Image and Image Comics, largely in the romance genre. His newest 
or his first original graphic novel, The Magic Fish, is about a young man who navigates his life through fairy tales and the power of stories to uh, to bring us together, even when we're at our most vulnerable. It is so, so wonderful. I'll be throwing links, like I said, go and check it out. Um, thank you both so, so much for being here. I am so excited to listen in. Of course, if you need anything, scream for me, I will be listening. And the rest of you, I leave you in their capable hands. Uh, don't forget to throw your questions in the Q&A box and I will see you soon. Thanks, Allie. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Allie. Trung and I were hoping for like around 12 people uh, <laughs> and now we have 65 of you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I have way too many questions to ask you about your comics. Um, I figure let's just dive in so we can use our sort of 40-ish minutes that we have to talk as effectively as we can. Um, Trung's been doing a lot of these events. You were just telling me that you've been doing a lot of virtual book touring. Mm -hmm. So he's used to it. We can handle yes. this. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Nicole has kept me super busy. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny, you you do all this work on a book and then there's all this work after. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I, I do end up writing a lot of like book reports on my own books, which is great, I think. Uh, it's lovely, it's finally like the book report where I've actually read the work. I know, it's incredible. Although sometimes it surprises me. It's like, wait, that happened in my book? I don't remember that. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. happened to you yet, where it's like, Absolutely. you look at a panel. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I'm like, when did I do this? Why did I make this choice? It works, but like, well, I don't remember <laughs> consciously doing it. I know, well, we'll get to talking about this incredible book. I wanted to take a minute before we dive into the comic to talk about how you got to the place where you could draw so proficiently, tell such beautiful stories, publish a graphic novel and do all of this. So the first thing I was wondering is just like, what, what was the media in your life when you were a child? Like, what were you reading? What were you watching? I sort of want like the mood board of your inspiration from your youth. Oh, sure. Yeah. So I read a lot of fairy tales when I was a kid and I loved them so much because like the character in the story, like I spent a lot of time in the library picking stories so that I can read them with my family so that mm -hmm. we could shore up our English speaking skills. Mm -hmm. And so the library, like the public library has a lot of sentimental value for me. It's something that I always think about really fondly. And I love like very old kind of turn of the century fairy tales and some kind of contemporary ones too. I grew up reading a lot of um, picture books that were illustrated by the Dillons or Trina Shart Hyman and just a lot of like illustrators like Tommy DePaola, people who were very proficient at making children's books. And so mm -hmm. a lot of the imagery that I kind of draw from tends to come from like very young and kind of like older children's books. Um, yeah, so it's, it's mostly like just a lot of children's media and I didn't end up reading a lot of comics, I think until I was a teenager. And when I was much younger, I used to read like a lot of like Archie comics and I discovered like oh. Tintin comics as well. And I loved yeah. those as a small kid, but I didn't really think about them as like, oh, this is a comic book. And I had no idea that there were stores that were dedicated to selling comic books either. They were just books that existed in the library alongside everything else. Yeah, when did you sort of figure out, I feel like everyone has a moment when they figure out that comics aren't just kind of books sitting among other books, it's like its own little world. Mm -hmm. When do you remember sort of figuring that out? I think I figured it out when I was in high school and somebody mentioned a convention and I had <laughs> never even heard of the conventions. I was very sheltered. I went to parochial school for my entire life. Mm -hmm. And so I had like very few avenues by which I could like explore media. And a lot of my consumption of media came before like the internet came into full bloom in terms of the way that we use it now. And so there wasn't like a lot of like YouTube or social media. So I didn't hear about it until someone, until I like knew someone who was like, oh, like you seem to have an interest in comic books. There are physical spaces where people congregate in order to talk and celebrate comics. Yeah. So that was, yeah, so it was, I came to it very late. I feel like that's sort of the first threshold is figuring out that like comics are a thing and then it's kind of the next threshold, like, can I make them? And then this other threshold of when you actually start to get to know other cartoonists, how did you, how did you first meet other cartoonists? Um, I started going to local events that were put on by um, bookstores here in the mm -hmm. Twin Cities a couple of years after I graduated from college. Um, I didn't really have like a strong sense that I was going to be making comics at all. And mm -hmm. I kind of started doing it by accident after I went to college um, and posting them on the, the internet. And I started getting really excited about them. And uh -huh. when I realized that like they came from real people that I could meet and talk to and people who had like more stories to tell and lives to live, I, 
um, I kind of like got up the gumption to like participate in events that were being put on by um, local bookstores in my area. And also the local um, art college, MCAD, is pretty yeah. open to like having people from the public kind of joining in on some of their events. And so I got to meet a lot of people there and kind of ask questions in passing. And everyone was very open about um, getting me in touch with their friends or making sure that I had, you know, some resources that they thought that yeah. I would find really useful. So I had a really, really nice experience being welcome into comics. That's so lovely. I, so you just sort of like brushed over college. You studied studio art, oil mm -hmm. painting and art history? Yes. Yeah. I minored in art history and I okay. majored in studio art and with a, with a focus in oil painting, which is super different from what I do now. Yeah, it was. I wonder, I actually feel like the best cartoonists are the one who, who did something else for a while. Do you think that what you did in college informed your comic making? Yeah, absolutely. I swear up and down that taking art history courses has been the most helpful thing for oh. me in terms of my artistic development because it helped me communicate my desires and my expectations and my priorities aesthetically, which is not really something that I could get anywhere else, I don't think. Like I would, you know, mm -hmm. I would take literature classes and I would do a lot of reading and I loved my sociology courses, but it was the art history courses that kind of like gave me the most aha moments where there were things huh. that I appreciated about imagery that I never really had the words to say and describe. And once I had them, I just couldn't stop like looking for more avenues by which to appreciate imagery. So art history was the thing that made me interested in, you know, continuing to work in visual media at all. And I think that was super helpful because comics is oftentimes very collaborative. You're expected to work with people yeah. who don't have a strong like visual, like descriptor vernacular, like not necessarily mm -hmm. a visual vocabulary but like they don't know how to talk about images in the same ways that you might and so it's you know learning how to be very clear about imagery before you yeah. start making the imagery was so important to me that's amazing and so much about comics you know I think it's it's hard to know until you've made a book as long as the magic fish that mm -hmm. I mean every page has so many images in it it has so many decisions and being able to like see the images for what they are and think about connecting them, it's so much work. And I think a lot of it is just being able to sort of see, see the imagery clearly. And it sounds like art history really brought that out for you. Yeah, absolutely. It was just, it was my favorite subject. And I really wanted to switch over to an art history major, but I came to it too late. <laughs> but oh it, yeah, it's super important for me. Wow. And then after that, you accidentally fell into comics? How does one accidentally fall into comics? Oh, man. So <laughs> I had been kind of like drawing for most of my life. And I loved like, um, I liked making comics. And I knew that like, it was something that I like to do to cool down after I'm, you know, having a stressful day at school or something. And I was originally really interested in doing curatorial work. And I am like, mm -hmm. I'm a first and a half generation immigrant. And so I'm very practically oriented. Yeah. I'm like, I have to go to a school that gives me a really good scholarship based on my grades. Art schools aren't going to do that. So I'm going to go to a university. And so I went to a university and I graduated and I was like, okay, well now I have to get a job that pays the bills because I can't just be making art if that's not something that I can, you know, that can I, I can support myself with with any certainty. And so I made a lot of decisions to make sure that I could like dabble in art, but like kind of work professionally in a different sphere of art that was a little bit more sturdy. And I had gotten an internship. It was my dream internship at the Minnesota Historical Society. And I was so excited. And I was doing research for the history players. So the performers who would dress up as historical characters yeah. um, and, you know, would perform for school children on field trips. And I got to do the dramaturgical research. And I got to look at a lot of sewing samples because the person that I was in charge with was Harriet Bishop, the first school teacher to come to Minnesota. And there was a lot of like, there's just so much like I, you know, would put on the white gloves and I was real excited about about this internship. And then that summer when I started, there were some uh, budgetary disagreements between the Democrats and the Republicans. And so the oh, government no. shut down because they couldn't meet their deadline. <laughs> and so all non-essential personnel was um, were relieved of their positions. And so I just lost my internship and I had to figure out something else to do. And it was also a graduation requirement for me. So I had to scramble to figure something else out. Yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't be allowed to graduate from my college, which would oh my have been God. a huge bummer. The whole so, point of all this, yeah. Yes, exactly. So I had to, so I just like, while I was really stressing out, I was just like, okay, I'm just going to keep making comics and work out my feelings and go to my comfort place. And I found something else um, to do internship wise that also wasn't super related to comics. I wound up working at the, um, 
uh, Center for Book Arts in Minnesota. And so I learned okay. how to like make physical books and like, you know, make paper out of pulp and like do all kinds of really cool things that gave me an appreciation for materials outside of like thinking about them theoretically in art history. So that was also like kind of a nice happy accident. And then people started finding my work online and I became a comics artist magically overnight. Oh my God, did you? I'm always, I'm so curious because it's, it, something similar happened to me where like you just sort of get found online. You don't even sort of mm -hmm. intentionally are like, I'm stepping into the world. I'm going to be a cartoonist. People are going to see me. How did it feel to put your work online before anyone found it? And then I'm curious how it felt after people like sort of started probably freaking out about it. Yeah. And I think my motivation ended up being really uh, different. Like when I started, I think it was like, like it started from a place of like, I am seeking comfort. So I'm going to make the artwork that makes sense yeah. to me and that speaks to me as a person. And so I'm going to work out all of my feelings and all of my anxieties and just like all of the things that make me really happy onto the page. Um, mm -hmm. And I used to do it with really cheap materials too. Like to this day, almost none of the material that I use um, for traditional artwork can be mm -hmm. like, are necessarily like art store specific. I go to Office Max and like, I buy the copy paper and like the mm -hmm. ballpoint pens and that's, I'm yes. usually good to go. Um, and uh, I think after I started posting on the internet, like comic artists that I admired started to like kind of take notice and then I was like oh like these people really think that I can like, like I can actually do this and it sort of emboldened me to do more um, work that was either riskier or um, just kind of like take more chances and grow kind of on purpose mm -hmm. um, and now I don't post quite so often anymore and I kind of like my relationship with social media has sort of shifted now it's not such a necessity which is really nice. And I can like kind of return to a place where I don't feel like I have to keep churning out work to keep people interested in me. I can just have a portfolio yeah. and like just work on the things that make me, that make me feel galvanized to continue to make comics. Yeah. And how, you know, a graphic novel requires so much labor. How do you, I don't know how people fully balance that with kind of putting their full minds and selves online simultaneously. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's incredible those those who can do it, but I also I would be so exhausted. Yeah, it's one of those things where like you kind of have to learn to, and this was also something that I had to learn on the fly is that when you are making art, I guess now there's an outfacing yeah. element to it that I don't think that a lot of our forebears had to experience. And so we yeah. have to be really intentional about boundaries and how we are using the specific media that we're using. And sometimes that means taking a step back and realizing that maybe this is better. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even just thinking about what you said earlier and you know, the way you grew up and, and discovering books at the library, you had this sort of slow trickle of understanding and discovery towards comics. And now with a book like yours, out in the world, obviously people will find it at libraries and bookstores, but I think most people are going to find out about it on the internet mm -hmm. and kids who are young are going to find it. It's like the speed at which your art is getting out there is so different from the way you were consuming art as a kid. Yeah. It's just sort of a wild transition. It is a really wild transition. Like I kind of like when I think about making books, I sort of just imagine that people would start finding it 10, 15 years in the future after it's already been published right. and come into it by accident and getting immediate feedback like from people who are finding out about it right as soon as it published is not something that I had ever considered or thought about. And it's something I'm still figuring out how to navigate. It's really, it's a lot. Uh -huh. it's <laughs> I still don't know how to navigate it. I have you, I wonder how you feel. I find even positive stuff can be almost hard to process. Mm -hmm. Yes, certainly. I don't like I've made it a rule for myself that I will not read any reviews like whatsoever. So if they're positive, that's, great that's really great. And I don't I don't read them. I'm like, okay, that's really that's really nice. And if they're negative, I'm just like, well, you haven't tagged me in it. You have not made it my problem. You have very <laughs> kindly like kept me out of it. And I think that's really wonderful that you have thoughts about it at all. So I'm just trying to make sure that all of my like the way that I navigate this is very intentional. <laughs> yeah. Do people have a way to kind of reach out to you? Like have, have people who have read the book sort of found you and like wanting to tell you what they thought? Yeah, I mean, I get a fair number of messages. I've gotten a lot of very sweet messages on both Instagram and on mm -hmm. Twitter and mm -hmm. a few emails as well. And those are the only three avenues by which I make myself available to people like to communicate yeah. with. 
yeah. for the most part. And even then it feels like a little bit too much for me. I like for the most part prefer to just check my inbox once a day yeah. and then um, not have to worry about any of the other stuff. Um, and I try not to make myself super available on um, kind of more colloquial social media mm -hmm. spaces. Um, but occasionally I'll get very sweet messages and I am generally disinclined to respond, but sometimes I do. And it always feels really nice to be able to kind of um, respond to a little bit of feedback that way. Mm -hmm. But I'm still not really yeah. convinced that that's something that I want to do all the time. <laughs> yeah. And it's a slippery slope, right? But I'm so, I'm so impressed. I mean, this is your first sort of big graphic novel. And already I feel like you've established a lot of healthy habits as to how to process your personal work going out into the world. It's a, uh, it's a lot, but yeah. speaking of your personal, beautiful work, let's talk about the magic fish because that's what these 73 people are here for. Um, I would love to know about the process on the book, especially I know that the process changed partway through mm -hmm. from traditional to digital. Um, just like what, so you like, I assume you get this book deal. It's like, I'm going to make this book. When you sold the book, did you sell it as the magic fish ready to go? Or did you sell something looser? Um, well, uh, how did that process go exactly? Okay. So I started putting the pitch document together, Corey and mm -hmm. different agents. And I got a little bit of help kind of putting up, putting together like a preliminary package. And yeah. then I got a little, um, a lot more help refining it from um, my agent, Kate McKean, who is mm -hmm. on the chat. Hello, Kate. Hi, it's nice to see you. <laughs> Hooray for um, agents. <laughs> yes, she's wonderful. I adore working with her. Um, and so she really helped me kind of like refine the, um, uh, the pitch document and yeah. made it like as clear as, and as organized as it could possibly be. And then it started getting shopped around. And that part I don't, I didn't think about very much, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, over the course of a couple months, I got um, a couple of bites from some publishers and then it was just a matter of kind of negotiating which one was the right fit. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and that process yeah. was a lot smoother than I thought it was going to be because I had no mm -hmm. idea what I was doing. And the original pitch document that I put together was based on an animation pitch document that a friend of mine shared with me because I didn't know oh. anyone who had pitched a graphic novel before. Interesting. Really. Yeah, and so they were like, well, it's kind of similar to an animation pitch document. So here's something that I put together for Nickelodeon. And so I was like, oh, okay, so, you know, you need to have like images, you need to show what the pages are going to look like, you need mm -hmm. to have a clear idea of what your story is and like have the plot points set out so that your editors have a clear idea of what you want. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so it, it wound up being pretty smooth. Yeah. And did that document, like, how does that compare to the book that is now published? Did it, did you have a really clear idea of the story at that point or did it end up growing? Oh, I think it grew a lot, but it actually yeah. stayed fairly close to the outline as far as I can remember, because I had been thinking about the ways that the different fairy tale stories within the magic fish had connections to each other that were mm -hmm. personal to me for a very long time. And so I had a really clear idea of what the stories were and how they were going to be connected. And then it was just a matter of matter of um, refining the kind of uber story that mm -hmm. frames the rest of the fairy tales. Would it be a reach for me to say that this is like a story you've been waiting a long time to tell or? I, I think like that's accurate. Yeah. yeah. And there's also a little rush of like, I can't believe that I am getting to make a whole graphic novel with like a publisher that I admire. So I'm going to tell literally every story I've ever wanted to tell right now. <laughs> wow. Is, was there a pressure at all? I find the stories nearest and dearest to us can sometimes be the hardest to kind of execute the way we want them to be. And I, I'm getting the sense that you're a perfectionist. Also, I see this book. I know you're a perfectionist. <laughs> so I wonder how it felt to try to take, take all of this and really get it on the page the way you wanted it to be. Um, I think one of the more difficult things that I had to contend with was to make mm -hmm. peace with how to create something that didn't always live up to my expectations, because huh. certainly I'll look back on the book and see pages where I make decisions in order to make sure that I, you know, hit my deadlines mm -hmm. and to make sure that like my editors kind of know what's going on. Um, and I don't think that I would want to go back and do things differently. 
Like mm -hmm. at the very beginning, I was still kind of trying to suss out my process. And I was discovering that I was taking a lot of time redrawing entire page compositions and was eating up so much time oh um, because I wasn't super satisfied with the thumbnail process for some reason, or I just didn't think that the, you know, the text would like fit in such an elegant way. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, would end up reworking a lot of things. And I had to kind of learn how to roll with the limitations that would start to add up the further along you got in the graphic novel. So kind of letting go of the notion that like I need everything to look exactly the way that I wish that it looked in my imagination and kind of making peace with done is better than perfect is what was kind of like my biggest point of growth in making in making the book. And then so you would make thumbnails and then would you pencil and then ink? Was that mm -hmm. usually a process like that? Yeah, yes. I had a pretty regimented process of like do the outline yeah. first, then do, do the script, then the thumbnails, and then the um, and then pencils and then inks. And do you do all the pencils for the whole book and then do all the inks? I don't think that's how I did it. Yeah. I think that's what I had in mind, but like I liked <laughs> going back and forth, but I can't yeah. remember if I like did all the pencils first. I think I must have started inking pretty much right mm -hmm. away because that's my favorite part and I probably would have figured out a way to do that. <laughs> yeah. It's the and best I, part. It is the best part. It's where it's where the page really sort of coalesces and like you have something in front of you that looks like something that you that you had in your mind. Yeah, and speaking of inking, I, I was so, I was really excited when I read that you had intended for the book to be black and white. I really, and I, I'm, I, obviously the color is fabulous and we need to talk about color, but I love just your lines. To me, your lines sing so much on their own. Um, so you went into it maybe thinking it would be black and white, and then at which point did you sort of realize it was going to have to be colored? Well, I think it was kind of within the, it was in the, the, um, the pitching and mm -hmm. like the buying phase where the um, expectation was laid out that it, the comic was supposed to be in color. And I'm not someone who's very, um, who has a strong sense of color theory. Like I'm not, I didn't go to art school, so I wasn't very well trained in it. Not super confident in coloring my own work. Um, and so we sort of compromised and um, the, uh, I think it was, yeah, it must have been Gina that suggested a limited palette so that we could still use colors. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, yeah, that's something that I'm comfortable doing. And then it wound up being a really lovely and elegant way to make sure that the space, like the story universes are really evident to the reader immediately. So it, it lended itself yeah. to the readability of the book in ways that I didn't anticipate. So it wound up being great. Absolutely. It really did. It, it lended to the readability. I feel like it, it lent itself to the depth. There were so many compositions where I felt like the line art on its own was completely beautiful, but then with the color on top of it, it just had something else to it. Um, yeah, I got to like think about things in terms of like aerial perspective as well, which is something that you do in painting and I've never really seen done in comics in ways that I thought would be time like time sensitive or efficient. Um, but yeah, like doing something in color really, really helped bring that out. But that's, it is a lot of work to ink a graphic novel, but to color it too. And I think I saw that you used a color flatter, but even mm -hmm. still, that's a lot of work. How did you survive? <laughs> Oh my gosh, uh, I had a lot of late nights and I think I just like, well, the, the, the inking and the coloring process is sort of nice because that's when I get to catch up on my audiobooks. Yes. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that when you're writing. You have to be able to concentrate and like have your ideas down and know exactly mm -hmm. what the characters are saying. So like, I just, you know, I would go through books <laughs> and like turn on my comfort reads that I've already read before. So I'm not like super intent on paying attention to them. And then I can just go through and go on autopilot. And once I like hit that flow state, it kind of felt like things went by pretty quickly, but it was very exhausting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did your perception of kind of the graphic novel or I guess making graphic novels before you made the book, like it's, it's being pitched, it's sort of an idea. And then now at this point, like the book is done, you're going to make other books. Has your idea of the process of bookmaking changed? Um, you know what, I think I want it to, but I'm not at a place where I think I'm adept enough to change my process too much. Mm. I'm discovering that like, you have to relearn how to make a graphic novel every time you do. You do? Why did no one <laughs> tell me that? Yeah, yeah. And I had asked people and they gave me all different answers and I should have <laughs> gleaned that that's what it meant that like you have to, you know, it's different for every single project for every single creator. And so <laughs> um, I'm figuring that out now and I'm having a fun time with it because I, I'm feeling like more and more confident 
navigating just the uncertainty of where my project is going to go and how I'm going to be comfortable doing it. Yeah, I think you have to. I think there's no way to ever feel like, oh yes, I have comics, I've figured it out. I, mm -hmm. I fully understand it. This will be easy every time. Still waiting for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, you wrote so beautifully uh, at the end of the book about kind of how you think about comics and talking about this this idea that it is it's so much more than just like a word and a picture combined there's mm -hmm. this i don't know there's some magic that happens when we put words and pictures into pages into compositions into stories and sequences and that little bit at the end of the book was near another place where you were talking about you know this blend of languages in your household and i don't know i guess i just want to hear about what you think about comics and what you think about, it seems like a lot in your life is many forces coming together or things mm -hmm. that seem like maybe they wouldn't fit, but they fit. Um, I don't know, yeah. there's not really a question there. It's just sort of a lot of musing. Sure, certainly. I mean, I think one of the things that has always been important to me was the sense of like communicative syncretism where yeah. a lot of, where you sort of like reach really far in order to make concepts work together so that you can communicate a little bit more clearly because that's oftentimes like it's motivated by by love and a desire to connect with another person mm -hmm. and I think comics is such a wonderful avenue to do that because it is very syncretic it's a combination yeah. of words and pictures but they're together like a text in and of itself mm -hmm. and the way that I always describe it to um, like to teachers and to students is that um, a comic book is a th is, is a thing where the pictures are the text because the distinction between an illustrated book and a comic book is that the images in an illustrated book mm -hmm. are there to sort of supplement the text. They kind right. of support it and they do go hand in hand, but it like informs the text a little bit, but it's always dependent on the text. And uh, as we kind of like graduate into like more advanced reading, oftentimes the pictures go away and we sort of like rely on just our imaginations. And while that can be really motivating for some students, it does kind of take away that aspect of ourselves that can contextualize words and images together. And then mm -hmm. comic books kind of do this really wonderful thing where, um, put, where the images and the text kind of exist on the same plane and they yeah. inform each other and they interplay with each other and they interact with each other in ways that aren't so strict and separate the ways that like kind of older illustrated books are and so this sort of like this blend of words and images together as a text in and of itself kind of is this sort of natural extension of the ways that like a lot of people experience the world particularly like sighted people yeah. experience the world i suppose yeah. um yeah and so it felt like comic books feel like such a a, a natural storytelling medium to me I think they are. And I think there's something about it. Like there's a reason why we're never going to really figure it out. And there's a reason why every time you and I make another graphic novel, it's going to be really hard all over again. And we're going to be confused when we're thumbnailing. I think the possibilities can be so expansive. It's, yeah, I don't know. We can never, we're just going to sort of keep reaching for it. But the process of reaching for it, for this sort of understanding and connection is clearly the point, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're super correct about that too. Like the, the words and images interplaying together, it's such a dynamic thing that it's difficult to nail down like one correct way to do it. It's gonna be different every time. I know, even when you think about just placing a speech bubble or some narration or a thought and mix that with a character and a background, it's like already you have like six elements that you're coping with that could mm -hmm. be combined and I can't do math, but in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, it's really, yeah, it's just really remarkable. I love comics and I love the comics you make. Thank you. Um, no, they're just, they're so fantastic. I, I remember when I first saw your work on the internet, I was just like sort of scrolling past it and I was like, hold up, what's that hair? <laughs> Who drew the, that hair like this? This is incredible. Um, it was it was so noticeable. It was so special, uh, which makes me wonder about about your drawing style. It's so... I mean, for you, it's just the way you draw, right? But to everyone mm -hmm. else in the world, we're like, it's your style. Um, I sort of hate that description because style isn't always intentional. It's sometimes just the yeah. product of everything in our life. But I am curious about your drawing and how you developed it. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think like 
everybody's style. I, I also have similar reservations about the descriptions of the of people's aesthetics as styles because it is just like your handwriting. It's yeah. this sort of very natural thing. It like it, it gives away like your priorities. It's about what happens when you have to make images expediently and then you make choices in order to kind of like limit the amount of labor that you have to put into it in order to make it more efficient. And so mm -hmm. you end up, you know, revealing things about yourself and you kind of reveal like your priorities and the ways that you tend to like your aesthetics to be. And so it's it's more personal personal than just like a style that's being presented it's this unintentional like it's your the hand of the artist is in there and mm -hmm. you, you know you kind of want people to appreciate it for what it is and like whenever people ask me like what my style looks like like who I kind of draw inspiration from I kind of tell people that I'm like a style grave robber because most of the work that I look at are like from dead people <laughs> and so it's just a lot of like my a lot of turn of the century um, illustration and kind of the like arts and crafts movement informs the way that I like to put kind of decorative elements in my work. Um, but then it's also just a combination of everything else that I've ever seen. Like there's a lot of animation in it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of manga in it. There's a lot of like uh, be Belgian comics in it as well. Even like yeah. 1990s Archie comics can be found somewhere in my work. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, just, it's just everything. And I don't really do it on purpose. I know, and that's the key there, right, is I think, and it's something that younger artists ask a lot of me, and I'm sure they ask of you, is like, how do I develop a style? How do I kind of become a person who draws in a way? And uh, I know, I'm sorry, my cat in the background, he was just trying to eat something. <laughs> um, but yeah, we don't, it doesn't happen like that. We don't really choose the way we draw completely. We just sort of fight with it and work with it as best we can. Yeah, absolutely. It's a result of a struggle. Like it's a relationship. Like you you have a relationship with your work and the way that it looks is sort of the product of that push and pull. And I really like, you know, figuring that out about other artists. That's beautiful. It's very quotable and put that on a mug. Um, <laughs> we have, I want to, I have fun questions that I want to ask you. So mm -hmm. I have to ask you some fun questions. I have to ask you about being a chicken dad. Oh my gosh. So fun. Uh, <laughs> so I own... How was the story there? Sure. So I have three chickens. I live in Minneapolis and I have three chickens. It's actually not super uncommon here. People keep backyard chickens everywhere. Um, and I was very against the idea because um, it was my spouse's idea to get chickens. And I was like, I do not like taking care of anything with its own intestinal tract and its own personality. And that's kind of like, I'm just not really an animal person. And I, you know, will be a fun uncle, but like, I, I won't raise children. Like I won't like, like, I feel like that's way too much press pressure. And uh, my spouse was like, well, you know, like chickens are outdoor animals. They can take care of themselves. You won't have to do anything. And I was like, okay, fine, we'll get the chickens. And then uh, they got delivered from the hatchery. And then we picked them up mm -hmm. from the like egg supply store in St. Paul. And I had them like, my partner was driving and I had them in like a little cardboard box and they started playing with each other. And I almost started weeping. <laughs> So now I think we may have just the most spoiled chickens um, on <laughs> in the Twin Cities because I like, I wait on them hand and foot. I like was very overbearing the first year of their life because I didn't know what all the chickens like health concerns were. And so I was very careful. And I was like reading the chicken parent forums, because <laughs> they're, like farming forums that you can read that are like mommy blogs. So, you know, like just doing tons of research and like making sure that all my chickens were fed and happy was like a very, it was a lovely thing to have happen during the pandemic as well. Yeah. Because like I always had something to do. It gave me an excuse to like get away from my work desk and go outside. So, yeah. You sound like a really good chicken dad. <laughs> I'm very overbearing. I once bought, um, Oh uh, God, I bought hemorrhoid cream for one of my chickens because she was starting to lay bloody eggs. And so I spent an evening applying hemorrhoid cream to her cloaca. And I had a what? moment where I was like, I'm not that? sure that I ever thought that I was going to be doing this in my adulthood, frankly. And here you are, cartoonist and person who buys hemorrhoid cream for their chickens. Yep. Um, <laughs> unrelated to chickens, but related to things to love. Uh, you made a tarot deck. I did. It was such a labor of love. I was doing it at, because I wasn't sure if I was going to be in comics or yeah. in uh, illustration when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And so my way of doing like uh, an illustration exercise to kind of get me to shore up my skills was what if I do this like really long project with a series of kind of interrelated images. And yeah. then I started to become really fascinated with the history of the tarot deck and its mm -hmm. imagery and its relationship to the printing press 
and mm. the kind of popular imagination about like Egyptomania and Orientalism and the ways that like kind of Victorian sensibilities kind of informed the rebellion that mm. uh, the Order of the Golden Dawn kind of latched onto in order to kind of concoct the iconography of the tarot deck too and how to be critical about that in the today times. Yeah. So yeah, so it was a very egg-headed process, but I, I had a lot of fun with it. That's awesome. And it, it, someone in the chat said several tarot decks. Yes, I mean, <laughs> I've Truck. made um, uh, uh, three. I'm working on my fourth one right now, but I've completed three because I just, I really wanted to learn how to read with them as well. And so I- while Have you figured I it out? Them, yeah, I figured it out. And nice. while I was making it, I, uh, yeah, I just needed to have something that was done and in my hands. <laughs> um, so I made a couple of like cutesy, like small and easy tarot decks to tied me over until my star spinner deck was all done. That's amazing. Um, where can people get them? So these 73 people can go buy your tarot decks or buy them. <laughs> they can be uh, found anywhere. You can order them through your local bookstores. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's what I love to hear. Yes. Um, we have 12 for the Q&A right now. So I think we should start. Okay to go through these. How do you feel? Absolutely. That sounds great. Let, let's do it. So Emily wants to know, Emily says, hi, Tron, loved your comic. What's your favorite type of fish? Thank you. What is my favorite type of fish? My favorite type of fish to eat or my favorite type of fish to like just see? <laughs> um, I think uh, I like salmon to eat. Like it's just very basic, but like it's easy to cook. And so it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's difficult for me to mess up and it's so consistent. So that's, probably my favorite fish to eat my favorite fish to look at mm -hmm. I think are the angelfish because they're so like they're so flat and I like the way that they move awesome good yep. answer <laughs> uh Peter wants to know what your next book is about which is something I was going to ask you about your future mm -hmm. yes what's happening um, next so same question my next book is about a young woman who finds herself constantly overcommitted because she's worried about missing out on things in life and then she learns that she has to prioritize as she becomes closer to becoming an adult and the ways that she discovers it is kind of through the help of her friends and her relationship with her family and through an adventure that is almost a pastiche of a particular fairy tale that I won't give away right now. This sounds very relatable. That sounds fantastic. Are you working on it right now? I am working on it right now. I, I still owe my editor like a completed script and I've been kind of bouncing back and forth about whether or not I want to do like an inchworming process or like, uh -huh. um, uh, or like a script, like a very regimented like script first and then thumbnail and then, and then I think I have to go with like the very regimented process because I need to have those words written down. Yeah. Oh, that's super exciting. Wow. From mm. one book to the next. That's how it goes. You're always talking about the book you're not working on. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. Okay, Kelly asks, question for both. Your works have mature themes but feature child protagonists. When you were writing, were you imagining a child or adult audience for your books? What do you think, Drun? I think, um, well, based on what I've read in your books as well, mm -hmm. like we might be on the same page about this, but I don't think mm -hmm. about my audience's age very much when I write books. Like I'm used to, like I'm used to fairy stories and they like oftentimes were stories for children, but they're terrifying. Um, yeah. I think children have a really good sense of like what is or is not appropriate for them and what they're ready for and what they're not ready for. Mm -hmm. And so they can kind of tell when you're talking down to them and sanitizing things. And I don't ever want to do that to my reader because, you know, no matter how young they are, they might be very sophisticated in their ability yeah. to contextualize a story. And so I don't tend to think about like, um, think about whether or not, you know, my story is appropriate for a certain age range. Um, mm -hmm. I tend to write within a, like an, uh, an older middle grade and YA range mm -hmm. for the sake of publishing to keep things neat. But I don't really think that like, like I'll get feedback and like, I'll try to suss out what is appropriate, but oftentimes I don't really think about that very much. Yeah, I think, I think there's a difference between thinking like, is a 12 year old gonna read this book? And, but that's like one mindset and the other mindset is just like, I wanna sort of respect my audience and trust mm -hmm. that they can, they can try and see what I'm trying to say. And I do think that comics are, uh, there's something different. like mature themes and comics come across very differently than they do in like movies or television or even mm -hmm. sound or an audiobook because it's drawn and because we're drawing it there's so much connection to it at, that I think I think cartoonists are very well equipped to handle mature themes mm -hmm. um even with child protagonists yeah and I think the other thing about that question is oftentimes if you're getting them like 
from educators or from librarians. Mm -hmm. Like the question that I think people are trying to ask is what will parents think of their children reading this book? And that's a very different question. Yeah. And very unique to each parent. And mm -hmm. I've had 18 year olds who don't feel comfortable reading my books. I've had seven year olds who are comfortable reading my books. You just never know. Every kid, every family is different. Um, Great question. Next one from Baz. Trungles, I purchased your tarot deck, tarot card set a while back and have been adoring them. And then I happened upon your book at my local books, bookstore. I almost like exclamation point. I know this art style. The Magic Fish was such a wonderful experience to read. What inspires you to make art and tell stories? And any advice for students trying to get their work out there? So first question, what inspires you? Second question, advice for the students trying to become you. Sure. So um, I think I'm pretty internally motivated to tell stories. Like it's just mm -hmm. something that I really like to do and I feel compelled to do it. So it almost feels vocational to me. Like this is what I'm meant to do. I'm meant to continue to tell stories in this particular medium. Um, and so I, I think like just kind of reading other people's stories and getting a sense for like what the world looks like. I like the interplay between different stories and different people. I tend to love the notion that a story tells you more about the storyteller than the content has anything to say most of the time. I love um, that. Yeah, and so like everybody's relationship with a work is, you know, going to be different and it mm -hmm. really motivates me to kind of explore that even more. Um, so that's, so that's kind of like my answer for like what I like to do as far as like my style I like I answered it before a little bit but I like kind of turn of the century artwork and children's books um, mm -hmm. kind of at the at the height of the popularity of like the gift book and the relationships between illustrated books and galleries. Um, so I tend to really like Kai Nielsen and I like Harry Clark and the way that he illustrated like the Edgar Allan Poe poems, like those really creepy decorative like images are things that kind of stick in my mind when I go to sleep. Um, advice for students uh, in terms of like getting their work out there, I think um, one of the things that I always tell people is uh, that it's really helpful to make lateral relationships with your peers because you'll all kind of come up together. Advice. Yeah, because it's like, it's one thing to like start by like contacting your heroes, but that always yields very mixed <laughs> results um, because they're not there to guide you necessarily like especially within the art world it's very uh, decentralized and oftentimes people don't see their roles as like caretakers for others but if you kind of make connections with your peers on a lateral level you'll come up together your heroes will eventually also become your peers and you have a network of support and for people to draw on and people to kind of you know ask advice about like whether or not a publisher is going to pay them very well and like what their rates look like so it's it's nice to to connect with people who are doing similar work even if you don't feel like you're getting anywhere immediately yeah that's great advice that's really wonderful advice and the next question is similar it's it's advice for people who hope to create graphic novels i mean when you think about someone and and the same the next question is also sort of similar how a good starting point for someone who wants to start creating comics what do you what do you think about that um i think one of the great things about comics is that they are endlessly accessible um, mm -hmm. to make. And so mm -hmm. I think that uh, if you if you're someone who finds that you are really interested in writing like kind of gags, like doing that three panel um, yeah. Sunday comic like format is really, really helpful because it's very limited drawing. It kind of gets you to feel comfortable with the medium. Um, starting with really small projects is always really helpful. And then also kind of just like journaling and mm -hmm. writing out your thoughts and then just putting pictures next to them and seeing how they interact with each other and how you feel comfortable like putting them next to each other. You start to develop your own sensibilities that kind of really lend itself to crafting, like creating a really unique voice. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so just kind of start doing things that feel a little bit intimate that you don't feel like you need to show to anybody. And you might end up making something that you're really proud of somewhere along the line. Ah, oh, that's really good advice. Um, comics are super accessible. What was, from Anonymous, the most fun part about creating the magic fish? Ah, the costuming research was my favorite <laughs> part. I had Pinterest boards everywhere and I got to read about like the history of like fabric and the ways that it was distributed like during the wars. I got to read about like how um, in the popular imagination, why do we think princess dresses look this way? What is that yeah. cut? And, like, when did it become really popular? Um, and then I got to do a lot of research on um, like figuring out like what people wore in 
uh, mid-century Vietnam. Those are not things that I had ever been exposed to and I didn't have resources to it. A lot of it are language specific. Mm -hmm. And so kind of like exploring my roots and trying to figure out where um, things come from in my head kind of visually and identifying yeah. why I'm sentimentally attached to the way things look um, that was a really kind of special part of that process. So doing that, so doing my own dramaturgical research was my favorite part. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, next question. They're really stacking up. Good job, you 73 attendees. Yeah, wow. um, I know, it just keeps growing. Um, Stephanie asks, uh, as a fellow Vietnamese American with immigrant parents, I want to eventually write some kind of memoir or personal essay about my life. However, I'm concerned about putting my parents slash family on blast and making them look bad, uh, in parentheses, very Asian to keep our traumas close to chests, <laughs> to keep slash safe face. How did you make your decision to speak your truth and include your family in your story? Well, first of all, I think I'm cheating a little bit because I'm making a graphic novel and my parents literally had no idea what I did for a living until like last year. <laughs> so, um, and so they're not people who are well-versed in reading graphic novels. I don't think that they know what the book is about. But mm -hmm. also um, my parents, like a lot of the decisions that were made and a lot of like the mindset in the book from the mm -hmm. perspective of the parents is kind of inspired by the ways that my parents really tried to connect with me as a kid. And mm -hmm. so I had a pretty positive story to tell about my parents and that's not always going to be the case. Um, and so if, uh, I think it, it really just kind of depends on what you want your relationship to look like. And that's not really something that I can speak to with any authority because I had such a different context for making the book that I did and a very different relationship with my parents, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an intense question. It's hard. Um, I won't go into it, but memoir is hard. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Jim, I know Jim. Jim is asking, uh, Trung, there was definitely a lot of planning and thinking that went into this book from concept to execution, but was there ever a point where you had an idea or breakthrough that surprised you and changed the direction of the project or that you ended up somewhere different than you thought you were heading? So Jim sort of asking, was it this straight line or were there any moments where you kind of took a left turn? Um, I think as far as the story beats went, like everything mm -hmm. kind of fell into place pretty much as expected. There weren't a whole mm -hmm. lot of surprises for me there. Um, a lot of the surprises kind of came from the ways that I wanted to tell the story visually and the kind of aesthetics yeah. that I applied to each of the fairy tales, especially the last one. Like I had to really examine the visual imagination of someone who um, maybe grew up watching a lot of like wuxia movies. And so doing a lot of research into like what those costumes look like and like applying the water sleeves to the mermaids was a decision that was kind of really um, fortuitous and surprised me when I started doing mm -hmm. it. So that was kind of like a fun surprise um, when I, you know, started doing a little bit more uh, kind of visual research because I didn't start doing that kind of, um, that kind of reading to make the book until I was uh, well into inking it, I think, actually. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I should have done it during the thumbnail stage, but it was just one of those things that kind of surprised me as we went along. So, yeah. Um, Emily wants to see pictures of your chickens, and I'm pretty sure they're on your Twitter. Am yes, I they're, thinking they're, they're... they're everywhere on my Twitter, but I will, I will post some more pictures of my chickens, both on Twitter and on Instagram after this event is over <laughs> so that you can see Thank you. my precious baby girls. Um, Peter wants to know how much of you is in the book? I assume a lot. Yeah, like a lot of me is in the book. Um, the, uh, I watered down a lot of my experiences in terms of like how the story would be told, but a mm -hmm. lot of the, like the, the tension between like the school teacher and the administration and her bringing in um, a clergy member to talk to the family was something that I experienced in high school. Um, wow. And so it was a lot of like uh, kind of working out the ways that um, oftentimes immigrant families don't feel comfortable, at least linguistically navigating institutions that are kind of there um, with the presumption of protecting them. Mm -hmm. And so immigrant kids oftentimes have to navigate those by themselves or guide their parents through it. And it's oftentimes a little traumatizing when you have to deal with it separately and you don't know how to support each other. And so that was something that, that was like the biggest, like very me specific experience that I put into the book. Huh. Awesome. It's really, it's a really interesting dance when you want to put yourself in it but only sort of so much and then it has to sort of work within the boundaries of a story and so there has to be like an arc and mm -hmm. structure it's 
Yeah, it's yeah. a really it's a really interesting thing. If we were going to talk for another hour, I'd want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have that time. Let me see if I can get through some more of these questions. Uh, Stephanie wants to know which of your tarot decks do you feel the closest to? Good question. Um, honestly, it's whichever one I'm working on at the moment. I still read the most. <laughs> Very with relatable. The Star Spinner deck, yeah, and that's the one where like I've learned all of the cards best, mm -hmm. and so I think about the images in those cards if I'm reading cards with like a pip with the like pip cards instead of fully illustrated suits. Um, but yeah, it's whatever I'm working on at the moment. It's perfect. Um, Matilde wants to know, why did you choose the fairy tales you did for Star Spinner, the tarot deck? Why are they such successful archetypes for understanding ourselves? I'm sure you've um, thought about this. Yeah, I picked the fairy tales that were um, visually arresting first and foremost. Um, Little Mermaid features a lot in all of my work, and so that's why the suit of cups is entirely full of mermaids. Um, but some of the other story references, they're often Anderson stories, and they're often stories about kind of transitions and moving from place to place, because oftentimes mm -hmm. the cards are about changes in your life that kind of, that you sort of experience or weather. And so like finding those in fairy tales is very, very easy. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. And I feel like fairy tales, I don't know, similar to what we were saying about comics, is you can probably just sort of keep going further and further into it and you're never going to find an end. Like there's always going to be some, there's going to be another story or there's going to be another aspect to a story that you're going to discover. It just seems, seems very, uh, very vast. Okay, next question. Streamlining the process of comic making is still something I'm learning. Could you talk about ways you found to make the process easier for yourself? Oh, we alluded this to this earlier, but we the did. process that I originally went through um, with the Magic Fish was to do things traditionally because that was how I was comfortable. And then I realized that I couldn't hit all of my deadlines if I had to like clean up the page and scan <laughs> and then format and then send every single one. And yeah. so I had to learn how to work digitally in order to streamline that process so that when I was done drawing a page, I was just done and I could send it. Um, so that was the way that, that I wound up doing it. And then I think kind of like having the pages planned out a little bit more meticulous, meticulously in advance mm -hmm. really helps me speed up the inking process as well. So you kind of find ways to do it yeah yeah and it's i think it's important to remember too that process is fluid so even if you do some of this book digitally you can do your next book traditionally you can do your next book digitally it can always it can always change you're never stuck with one okay what are your comfort audiobooks i also want to know mm, okay Will you tell um, us absolutely so i love the uh old kingdom series uh by garth oh. nix and so i reread those all the times the audiobooks are done by tim curry and so they are amazing um i love reading the predane books by lloyd alexander so those books are also like a great comfort read and then i love jeanette winterson books quite a lot because her prose mm -hmm. style is so beautiful even though it's a little bit mystifying sometimes sometimes um plot wise and uh gosh what else uh and then other than that what are you listening to, to right of, now right now I'm listening to The Secret Commonwealth by Philip Pullman because his dark materials is also a comfort read of mine so I go through those books mm -hmm. quite a lot nice okay we have three minutes and we have too many questions to answer in those three minutes um I am going to uh, read out the last question. Would you ever publish a mini book or a zine of all the costume research or any collections of the little daily life comics you've posted on social media over the years? Oh man, I should get organized and do that because <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. I've already done all the work. I just need to put them together. Yeah, yes, I do plan to to do that someday. Um, I don't know how much I can do in terms of like the stuff that I've put together for the Magic Fish, but often like a lot of that is kind of in the in the very last segment of the book anyway. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I do plan on making more zines in the future. Nice. And then with our last two minutes, what... Uh... What are you gonna do for the rest of the week? What does your life look like right now? Just like paint a picture for us. Oh man, okay. So this weekend I'm planning on relaxing a little bit because I've mm -hmm. had a very busy week and I just watched WandaVision as well. And so like, I'm very like emotionally heightened <laughs> um, because I'm very sentimental about the Scarlet Witch. She's like my favorite superhero. I often read superhero comics, but like I have very little interest in actually making mm -hmm. long form superhero comics myself. So it's one of those things where I'm just like, oh yeah, I like prefer to consume these things and not to make them. Mm -hmm. um, although that's changing just a little bit. Uh, and uh, the rest of this weekend, oh, uh, I got a bunch of uh, prints 
framed and I'm starting to like decorate my new house a little bit more. So it looks new like people actually live here. Yes. I bought a house over the summer. I was very excited to move in. It was a very, very, very lucky time to do that. Thank you. Yeah. I but also just bought a house. It's insane. <gasps> it's wonderful. Isn't it fun to like have a space where you're like, I can do anything I want <laughs> to this yes. space. Yes. Oh my God. I feel like we, we should collaborate sometimes. I, I want cartoonists to make comics about their houses and like the moving in yes. process and like forming relationships with your house. So if you ever want to make a comic about that, I'm down to- I'm to super down. I have so many thoughts and sentiments about getting a new house. I know. Well, that's, that's it. I know we can't hear clapping, but I know that these folks, I hope they had a good time, but uh, this was wonderful. Trung, you're amazing. I feel so lucky to have spent this hour with you and obviously follow Trung's work, buy books, buy tarot decks, do the thing, you know? Oh, thank you so much, Tilly. You asked such wonderful questions. This was such a fun conversation. This hour just flew by. <laughs> I can't believe it's already over. I know, I know. Now we can go unwind. <laughs> yes, we can like chill out a little bit, mellow. <laughs> Yeah, any any final thoughts, Allie? You know, I think you guys wrapped that up great. I'm just gonna say what, what they said. Come in, buy books. We wanna see you. Let us know if you were here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you both so, so much for being here. I was texting uh, Nikki <laughs> and uh, she, she's here watching too. She's a coworker. Uh, and we were both talking about how you guys are superstars the whole time. So oh. <laughs> thank you both so <laughs> much for being here. This was so much fun. And uh, the rest of you, come on in, come buy books and we'll see you soon. So have okay, a good night, everybody. You. Hi, everyone. everyone.